As a curator of social history, I often find that certain historical figures are remembered and perhaps championed above others. Others who left behind legacies that have equally shaped and defined our society today. One such person is the suffragist turned Labour MP Ellen Wilkinson, who played a key role in campaigns for workers' rights and women's equality. A firebrand who left the political fringes of communism for Parliament, Red Ellen, as she was sometimes called, was Labour MP for Middlesbrough East and later Jarrow, and the first female Minister of Education. Although her time in this role was cut short by her untimely death in 1947, the policies she put in place worked to level the playing field, such as improving working class young people's access to higher education. Ellen had been born into a working class family from Manchester and had had to fight for her own right to a good education, culminating in a scholarship to the University of Manchester in 1910 to study history. Here, she became a Fabian, joined the Independent Labour Party and the university's debating society, becoming a confident and persuasive speaker. In 1913, she became an organiser for the Manchester branch of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, and two years later, the first national women's organiser of the Amalgamated Union of Cooperative Employees. Ellen, who was opposed to the First World War, was also a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and from 1920 to 1924, a member of the newly founded Communist Party. Ellen first stood for Parliament in 1923 as the Labour candidate for Ashton-under-Lyne in Manchester, and, and while she was unsuccessful, the setback proved short-lived, entering Parliament in October 1924 as the Labour candidate for Middlesbrough East. As the only Labour female candidate to be elected in this election, Ellen received considerable press attention. Many commented on her hair describing it as being as red as her politics. Ellen worked tirelessly in Parliament to strike a balance between speaking out on women's issues and contradicting the impression that female MPs, or orphans in the storm as she called them, were solely spokespeople for what were deemed women's issues. As she was quoted in the Western Mail, I represent an important industrial constituency where there is great unemployment. I mean to be in the middle of the fight on industrial questions and do not want to be regarded as some sort of specialist on women's questions. This is not to say though that Ellen was not a champion of women's rights. Her maiden speech called for women to have the vote on the same terms as men and for an increase in women's pensions. Later, the first bill she drafted, backed by the Conservative MP Nancy Astor, sought to enable women to join the police force. She also spoke up for equal pay. As a prominent supporter of the six-point group formed in 1921 by Lady Rhonda to campaign for women's equality, Ellen found her party's commitment to women's equality lukewarm. While Labour had supported the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies and its campaign for votes for women before 1918, after the war, the party encouraged its female members to not divide their commitments between socialism and women's equality. But Ellen's career demonstrated that they did not have to choose something that helps explain why she was such an important figure. Ellen represented working class women who, until 1928, might still find themselves disenfranchised and was a role model of modern womanhood, challenging the flapper caricature. At a Women's Freedom League event, Ellen acknowledged that the feminist cause had to change and grow for every generation and that they must restate their creed to catch the imagination of young women and use the instrument of their minds against all the bias and social wrong that still has to be faced. As MP for Middlesbrough, Ellen's support for the 1926 general strike, taking part in a nationwide speaking tour with Frank Horobin, captured the attention of the press. But throughout her time in Parliament, coverage often swung back to her gender, in 1930, a report of her second speaking tour of the United States, which focused on the need for unemployment insurance, digressed to comment on the silk undergarments she would be returning home with after a visit to an American department store. As Ellen frequently had to remind commentators and her fellow MPs, I happen to represent in this house one of the heaviest iron and steel producing areas in the world. I know I do not look like it, but I do. Ellen was a prolific speaker against the spread of fascism in Europe and critic of imperialism. She devoted much of her time, while briefly out of Parliament between October 1931 and November 1935, to calling for the relief of the victims of fascism in Germany and Spain and published The Condition of India. 
This was an uncompromising report based on a three-month visit she made in 1932 where she met Gandhi, then imprisoned for his opposition to British rule. Ellen's return to Parliament in 1935 as the MP for Jarrow came at a critical time. Rather than being an orphan in the storm, Ellen was a seasoned member of the House where she called for relief for the poverty-stricken families of her constituency, joining the some 200 men of the town who marched on Parliament with a petition calling for government assistance. Despite suffering with a long and painful illness, Ellen walked with the marchers as much as she possibly could. Breaking from the march to attend the Labour Party conference, she gave an impassioned speech in the marchers' defence, criticising the party's disapproval of their extra-parliamentary action which some had attributed falsely to communist influence. You cannot expect men trapped in these distressed areas to stay there and starve because it is not convenient to have them coming down to London. I tell the executive that they are missing the most marvellous opportunity in a generation. If you had seen that march from Jarrow, you would have realised that it was a great folk movement. I say this to the party. Put yourself at the head of a great movement of moral indignation in this country and say, our people shall not be starved. If we cannot do this, what use are we as a Labour Party? Her speech did not go down well. Not for the first or for the last time, Ellen, outspoken, passionate and hot-headed, found herself on the wrong side of both the press and her fellow Labour MPs. In 1939, she published an account of Jarrow's woes, the town that was murdered, arguing that its plight was not a local problem, but a symptom of a wider systematic evil. And while the march and Ellen's efforts were unsuccessful in the short term, they helped plant the seed of social justice in the minds of the middle classes, helping to pave the way for the great beverage report inspired programme of social reform that came in the wake of the Second World War. During this conflict, Ellen's evident skill and passionate oratory against appeasement secured a place for her in Churchill's coalition government, where she served under Herbert Morrison in the Ministry of Home Security. Here, she earned the nickname Shelter Queen for her efforts in ensuring the distribution, by the end of 1941, of more than half a million Morrison shelters. Ellen was now firmly on an upward ministerial trajectory. In June 1943, she became Vice Chairman of the Labour Party's National Executive and then succeeded to the role of Chair in January 1944 when the incumbent George Ridley died. In 1945, she was then appointed a Privy Councillor, only the third woman to receive this honour after Margaret Bonfield and Lady Astor. Later that year, she also joined the parliamentary delegation that travelled to San Francisco to witness the establishment of the United Nations. Ellen reached the height of her ministerial career when she became Minister of Education in Attlee's post-war Labour government, becoming the second woman after Margaret Bonfield to secure a seat in the Cabinet. In this role, she won resources for free school milk and meals, smaller class sizes, new schools and more county colleges. She also ensured the school leaving age was raised to 15. There is no doubt that, had she not tragically died in office, armed with her belief that education should be accessible and better for all, Ellen would have continued to bring the same tenacity, drive and success to her role as minister as she had done to every job and every fight she had ever undertaken.